Welcome everybody, I'm Steve Adler, Editor-in-Chief of Reuters, and I'm pleased to be here with Alphabet CEO Sundar Pichai. So welcome Sundar, good to have you. Uh, Steve, great to be here and thanks for having me. Great, well listen, I have to start with uh, the violent threat to democracy and uh, sitting US lawmakers on January 6th and a really pretty considerable continuing danger. Uh, YouTube live streams on January 6th uh, called for the overthrow of the government and promoted violence at the Capitol. Uh, YouTube videos on January 5th and earlier anticipated and celebrated what they called Operation Take Back. So my first question is, did Alphabet simply miss the extent of the danger? Uh, you know, first of all, I mean, last week's events, uh, you know, in a democracy, uh, a foundation of democracy is peaceful uh, transitions. And obviously, uh, you know, last week's uh, events were uh, grave, uh, chilling to see. And, you know, I'm glad as a country, uh, we are taking it seriously. Uh, and and hopefully, you know, we, we uh, you know, our democratic processes work and, and there's accountability through all this. You know, for me, uh, you know, stepping back, uh, we have been, you know, as a company, uh, you know, leading up to the election, uh, one of our, you know, this was the largest investment we ever put into uh, in terms of content moderation around election integrity. And, and you know, uh, lots of changes, uh, content policies, the way we approach political ads, uh, we made significant changes to what was allowed and what was not. And post the elections in early December, when states certified uh, YouTube implemented policies uh, and and you know and and declared content would be violative of our community guidelines if they asserted widespread uh, election fraud and so on. So we've been removing you know uh, you know thousands of videos, uh, including videos uh, from. Uh, President Trump's channel, if he found them to be violative, and and you know it's. A, we have uh, clear, consistent policies. Uh, you know, content moderation obviously is about identifying content at scale and removing it before people can see it. We reduce the spread. Uh, you know, we don't recommend or promote content uh, which we think is violative. And more importantly, we've raised. Uh, you know, we've given billions of views, uh, both in terms of labeling we have done, and we raise authoritative content. So from news organizations around moments like this. And, and there's been a lot of effort there. Having said that, just like with uh, elections four years ago and the potential for foreign interference, you know, we, we are constantly learning through these moments and, you know, the internet as a whole, I think, uh, you know, needs to come to terms with, uh, you know, what kind of information can spread. And, you know, it's definitely, there's more to do from all our side. So, I mean, I, I wanna come back to that a little bit because I don't think you answered this specific question of um, did, were you a bit blindsided by, by what happened? Um, I mean, you're doing things after the fact, you temporarily removed uh, new content from uh, Donald Trump's YouTube channel just last night uh, for a minimum of seven days. Uh, you suspended uh, Parler from the uh, Play Store app marketplace, although I gather not from other Android um, app stores. Um, I mean, is it a little like uh, you know, getting a smoke detector after the house was already burning. Uh, I mean, what, what, was it simply something that wasn't anticipated? Um, you know, we have been worried about, you know, a lot of our policies when we develop do take the possibility of real world harm. You know, that's kind of the foundation. Incitement to violence is something why, uh, you know, we, we, we put in new policies. And as I said earlier, you know, post the state certifying, we've been removing, uh, you know, uh, literally hundreds of videos which are violative. And so, uh, you know, I don't want to say we cl clearly anticipated uh, what happened last week to that extent, uh, you know, but the potential for uh, violence was something concerning, you know, there had been intelligence leading up to it. And, and, and so, you know, it was an area we had been taking it seriously, but, you know, obviously we will assess uh, you know, and, and make sure we can continue developing that. I mean, can, can you say today that the suspension of the Trump channel on YouTube will be made permanent? Uh, Steve, I think it's really important that, you know, we, we have policies that are expert teams which evaluate and, and 
you know, when we find content violative, there's warning and then there is a, a three strike process yeah. and, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and so, and it depends on the time period within which it, uh, you know, it applies. Uh, we took action based on the new videos that were uploaded. And those were the only videos which were uploaded uh, since the event. And, you know, we make these decisions, you know, uh, we, with the best faith efforts to be consistent and clear and transparent about how we do it. And, and uh, I think, you know, I think the teams have assisted uh, for a minimum of seven days. The comments have been suspended uh, indefinitely, but, uh, you know, we'll evaluate and we'll obviously update, uh, based on what we see. Okay. So you've, you've called yourself a technology optimist, and I'm just wondering if the recent events, both this past couple of weeks and recent years with all of the political and COVID related disinformation, <clears throat> the racist hate speech, has that shaken that optimism? And I, I guess I'd ask why or why not? Um, you know, first of all, uh, I, uh, I have deep faith in democracies. I, I grew up in India. My first memories when I was young, a young child was in the India. Uh, they had suspended democratic rule with the emergency powers. I remember my grandfather being, you know, I, could, I didn't fully understand why I was very young and, uh, you know, I'd, I'd never seen him that concerned. But over time, as I grew up, I began to understand how as a democracy, you work your way through those moments. and. And U.S. is a great democracy, and I, I, I do think we are uh, resilient to moments like this. And, and so, both my point is these things are not new. You know, as a country, we, you know, there are uh, challenging moments across history, and there will continue to be. And uh, you know, I think you know, it's a lot depends on how we handle it. To your question on technology, uh, you know, I, I continue to be a technology optimist. I, I see progress everywhere. Both it is true uh, that we dealt with one of the toughest moments in terms of the pandemic last year. It is also equally true that uh, we had the fastest development of vaccines no. in human history. No expert would have predicted we would have had multiple vaccines with this level of efficacy in this short a period of time. That validates to me uh, the progress of technology towards the end of last year when I saw a development like AlphaFold, where we were able to make, you know, a 50 year breakthrough in protein folding from DeepMind, that tells me in the future, what kind of breakthroughs will be possible. Uh, you know, so I, 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 you know, I don't think I've lost my optimism. Uh, I'm gravely concerned like uh, everyone else at the, at the current moment and how we are working our way through it. But I, uh, you know, I also have uh, you know, uh, deep confidence in democratic systems and, uh, and, and, you know, I'm confident we will prevail through it. Okay. Let's turn to some other issues and then I'm going to come back. Uh, I'm sure to your great pleasure to things like antitrust, but, um, can, can you talk a little bit about where you're heading at Alphabet and Google? Uh, what are you most excited about in terms of what's coming up, product services, uh, innovation that, that we want to be watching for? You know, uh, uh, at a high level, you know, across Google and Alphabet, you know, our deep bet is uh, that, you know, if you work on uh, foundational technologies and apply deep computer science, we can tackle many problems. Uh, the most foundational of all uh, is AI. You know, we've taken an AI first approach as a company and that applies everything to, you know, in Google last year, we had one of the biggest improvements in search results, thanks to, uh, you know, BERT, which was an advancement in, uh, AI using uh, transformers as a technology. The same AI is what powers robotics to uh, autonomous driving uh, to, to our drone delivery project. And so I view it as foundational across everything we do. And when I look ahead, uh, you know, I do feel we are at a point of inflection where, uh, you know, AI is progressing, where it is improved. It, we will be better able to understand language, images, uh, text, speech, and, and do it all in a more generalized way than ever before. And, and so that foundational investment, how do you take that and apply it to user problems is something, uh, you know, I think is gonna be foundationally exciting for us. Uh, we are also obviously evolving as a company in addition to serving consumers, we are taking not just AI, our core technical infrastructure and platforms and solutions and bringing it to companies around the world. Uh, of all sizes with uh, Google Cloud and, and really excited about the progress uh, we're making there as well. 
Great. Can you talk a little bit more about self-driving cars, about Waymo? Um, what kind of timetable do you see going forward? Um, you know, kind of what's your five-year projection for Waymo? Where are we going to be? Uh, you know, it's obviously, you know, I look at the progress, uh, you know, we always took a very long term view and uh, went for a very hard problem, which is full uh, level five autonomy and, and, you know, and, and to do truly autonomous driving, uh, you obviously have to not have a time in mind, you know, you say it, it's a safety first approach and you have to prove you can do that in a very safe way that is acceptable to society. And so that's what drives progress for us. Uh, we have driven 20 million uh, plus miles on public roads and in Phoenix, we obviously have the ride share service now working, uh, working, which is an exciting moment. And, uh, you know, and, and, and the same technology we are applying not just applies to uh, cars for uh, people, but also for logistics and delivery and so on. And that's the Waymo BS service. Uh, you know, some I'm, I'm optimistic about it. I, I think in a three to five year time frame, you know, I think you know we, you know, compared to the very narrow ways in which it's working today, we'll be able to demonstrate it in you know much larger situations. Uh, but we'll be driven by the Waymo team is uh, really focused on safety first, and that's the kind of foundational approach we take. But in terms of business planning and revenue projection, are you projecting that? people will be on the road uh, autonomously driving in three to five years and that you'll be generating revenue from that? You know, in a five-year context, we definitely uh, hope to be able to uh, generating revenue. The exact yeah. use cases, the applicability are all still being defined. And, you know, definitely, as you saw, Waymo recently completed a, you know, fundraising round and, you know, it has a board and outside investors and yeah. obviously, you know, there, there's an expectation that comes with that. And so, you know, that's how we think about it. Yeah, okay. Um, okay, back to uh, regulation and antitrust. Uh, you've been accused by now dozens, I believe, of jurisdictions uh, across the political spectrum, and we're talking US and overseas, of a variety of uh, anti-competitive practices and including a number of your businesses uh, in terms of areas, is there's search, there's advertising, there's ad tech, uh, mobile apps, Android pre-install, shopping comparison products. Um, obviously, you don't believe that you are uh, anti-competitive. I, I guess my question is really, why in your view are so many governments and regulators wrong about how they look at your practices? How are they looking at, at them wrong from your perspective? You know, I think it's first, first of all, it's appropriate with uh, with scale comes uh, scrutiny. Uh, you know, as a company, there are areas where uh, we are ahead, areas where we are behind. And so, you know, uh, you know, you mentioned briefly uh, newer businesses like Waymo, but you know, when you take something like cloud or enterprise business, or when we make hardware, uh, we are a smaller player investing too. On our, on our core areas, you know, obviously, uh, you know, we operate at scale and I, I think it's important, you know, to some extent, uh, you know, I look forward to being able to make the case. Uh, you know, I think we have worked hard. Uh, we are one of the largest R&D investors in the world and we've been doing that for many years. Uh, you know, uh, I'm talking, you know, tens of billions of dollars uh, to stay ahead and innovate and make sure and everything indicates that users prefer using our services. And, and, and having said that, you know, we've always understood uh, with scale, you know, if there are feedback, uh, we've been open to regulation, uh, you know, privacy has been an important area where GDPR has given certainty. Uh, we are open to regulation, which makes sense. We just need to know the rules of the road. I think we are, we are making the case, we have always approached our work uh, following uh, the rules of the road, uh, you know, putting users first and innovating hard, and you know, and and uh, but having said that, you know, it's important to me that we constructively engage through these processes, and and uh, to the extent there is important feedback through that, and we need to uh, make uh, make changes, we will, and that's how we've always approached uh, approached uh, these uh, these yeah. processes. Yeah. So just to turn to one of the. Uh, cases, the, the federal government, uh, basically it alleges that you have a monopoly over search and you use it to block rival search engines. And one of the things people talk about specifically there is the fact that it's been reported that you pay Apple as much as 12 billion a year 
uh, to make Google the default on Safari and iPhone. The, the response I've heard is that from Google is essentially people don't use uh, Google because they have to, they use it because they choose to. Um, and I guess the question then that follows from that, well, why spend billions of dollars to be the default on Apple if people are going to choose it uh, anyway? Uh, look, we, you know, I don't want to comment on specific commercial partnerships, but stepping back, it's very convent, you know, it's a normal practice in industries, you know, app, pretty much all apps, uh, you know, pay to get distributed and making sure that products are easily available to users. And, and, and the question is, do you do it uh, like you would do consistently, you know, other players would do. Uh, it's also important to understand through all this, you know, we not just, uh, you know, across OEMs, across carriers, uh, you know, we compete in deals. We win some, we don't win others. And, but it's a way by which we also are sharing value with the entire ecosystem as well. And, and I think, uh, you know, and, and it's important for us to explain what we do there and these processes will allow us to do that. But over and over again, uh, you know, there have been cases where we haven't been the default and uses, you know, we see evidence where people change defaults to choose Google. And, uh, you know, and, and uh, we've seen that in other use cases as well. Yeah. No, and nobody's suggesting it's not a great search engine. So the question is, um, you know, if you're not trying to exploit uh, the monopolistic aspect of it, uh, you know, why would you pay to be the default? Um, I mean, you can follow up answer or just tell me you've already answered the question. Uh, I mean, I think today, for example, in app stores that are, uh, you know, company, if you're selling your product through a retailer, you pay for, uh, I mean, this is, I mean, there's, there's a way the industry works and we are part of it and, you know, and, uh, you know, there are, we want to make sure our services are easily accessible to users. And so we are doing, in some cases, it's other products and platforms who are, you know, creating a marketplace around these things and we are participating in that. And, but we do it with a view so that we can reach our users and be conveniently available to them. And I think it's natural for a company to do that too. And so, uh, but, you know, I look forward to being able to explain all this in the right construct further. Okay. So, so, so other of the efforts in this field are in the uh, congressional uh, regulatory part of it. And of course, Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act has gotten probably the most attention uh, in terms of regulations. And I want to press you on this because I know you and your team have to have thought about it a lot in detail. And... Um, you know, uh, many people think it provides too much uh, protection for the platforms to post misinformation and hate speech and disinformation. And to my knowledge, I've only seen Google sort of give vague expressions of openness to change. So I do want to press you specifically, since you have to have thought about it, um, how do you think it should be amended uh, both to uh, protect free speech and also combat disinformation? Um, look, this is an important topic. And so I've never seen something that is so foundational, which is so misunderstood. You know, uh -huh. Section 230 is foundational. Uh, it applies to, you know, people think it applies to only a few companies. It pretty much applies to user-generated content across everyone. You know, if you're putting up a website tomorrow and you have reviews on your website or you're taking comments, uh, you know, you rely on Section 230 provisions. I think the, the most misunderstood part of it is Section 230 is what promotes freedom of speech. It's what allows us to, uh, to really support freedom of speech, you also need to be able to take action against harmful content, for example, content that incites violence. And, and the context is changing. You know, COVID didn't exist a year ago. Uh, last week's events, uh, you know, you know, is something, you know, is, the context is constantly changing. In Google alone, 15% of queries every day we haven't seen before. Uh, and so Section 230 is what gives platforms certainty to go and act in new emerging areas and, and do what they need to create a, uh, to protect their users and support uh, freedom of speech. I think, you know, there are uh, good proposals. Obviously the US is thinking about it. Europe is thinking about it with its Digital Services Act. And I think there are, uh, you know, initial proposals which get into specifics about platforms needing to have both clearly stated policies, uh, you know, transparency around how they implement it, mm -hmm. giving users right of notification and, and mechanisms by which they can appeal, et cetera. And so those are all 
you know, to me, makes sense. And then there may be areas where there can be specific regulation based on a type of content, but you know, but you have to tackle that uh, narrowly and it needs to be done with a lot of thought because it is constantly changing. And, and, uh, and you know, in some ways from a company standpoint, having clarity there would help us, yeah. but it's also important to understand if you make it very onerous, yeah. it actually is very burdensome for newer companies which are you know trying to create products and services too so um uh, i definitely think it's a complex area i, I expect you know uh, there'll be a lot of uh, uh legislative engagement in this and you know hopefully we can all make progress there okay uh, thank you for that um something obviously near and dear to our hearts in the news business i want to ask you about that you're an avid reader of news which we all appreciate i know that you read the wall street journal in print each day and uh, reflecting the value of print. Um, I was at the Wall Street Journal when the Wall Street Journal decided not to give news away free, but to um, to charge for it. Um, do you think news organizations made a critical mistake in allowing their content to become a, a part of Google's search of free of charge? And would they have more con have more control over their financial viability? Obviously, the industry is in huge trouble uh, if if they had not become part of this search, Google search uh, community? Uh, Mr. Steve, you've been in the news industry for a long time. I, I think, you know, internet has been a big disruptor, uh, you know, in, in, in more ways that, than I can simply summarize. Uh, you know, I, I definitely think when I see the amount of traffic we give to publishers, uh, you know, and uh, I see the value we provide, Having said that, you know, advertising has, you know, it, you know, has definitely been impacted and not all publications other than a few mainstream publications uh, have been able to make that shift to subscription-based models. Yeah. We are, uh, you know, we recently announced a new showcase and we've committed to billion dollars in additional licensing revenue over the next three years. Uh, you know, across search and YouTube, we have really, we are promoting news content more than ever before. And we are committed to sending traffic. We are working hard to support subscription models uh, and, and improve how all that works. Uh, you know, I think we need to do more as a company here, but I do think the underlying trends which are driving disruption here are pretty profound. And, uh, and uh, you know, and, uh, and you know, all of us need to do our part. And I, I do think governments should look at you know, what better ways to support the news industry. And, you know, and I think those are all important things to think about too. So, so since we're short on time, I'm going to move to a couple more questions quickly, but i sort of as a yes or no, do you think Google has had more, has had a positive effect on the news industry or a negative effect, positive or negative? Uh, you know, I, I definitely think we have, uh, we've always been committed to high quality information. And, you know, we, when I look at the traffic we serve to publishers, uh, I always think we should do more, but I definitely think we've had a, a positive impact. Okay, all right. Um, so uh, diversity has been a big issue uh, in, in every business uh, and everybody's looking at it and trying to do better. Uh, you've had a lot of internal uh, controversy over diversity um, at Google. Um, I, I know women currently fill, uh, last I looked, about 20% of technical roles, 25% of leadership roles. There are all sorts of other diversity issues. Do you feel as if you're doing enough on diversity and where, and, and how do you see your diversity efforts having an impact? And then I'll have one more question after that, and then we'll open it up to the many, many questions in the last five minutes that are coming from the, uh, the audience. Look, the answer is we, we have a long way to go. Uh, as an industry, we are very behind. Tech is very behind compared to other industries. We were the, one of the first companies to uh, issue diversity transparency reports. And uh, last year, uh, we made significant racial equity commitments, both internally in the company, as well as externally as to what we do with our products. Uh, I'm encouraged by early progress. Last year, we saw, for example, the largest increase of uh, you know, black plus representation in Google since we started measuring it in our annual report in 2014. Uh, we've committed to, uh, we are holding ourselves accountable to improve leadership represent representation of underrepresented groups by 30% by 2025. Uh, but, you know, uh, last year, you know, uh, was a profound uh, year. I think it, you know, uh, there is reckoning for all of us to dig deeper and, and continue this work. 
uh, that, you know, and so we are, as a company, we are committed. Uh, we don't get everything right, but, uh, you know, we have, we have made our commitments public. Uh, we will share uh, annually our progress and, you know, uh, I'm committed along with the leadership team and everyone at Google to make progress here. Okay, thank you. Uh, my final question, then I'll turn it over uh, to the audience questions, which are going to come through me. Um, so so your, uh, your company is famous for the mantra, don't be evil, uh, sort of the founding mantra. It's something that people at Google took a lot of pride in and I think people looked at in the world. Um, is that still a working mantra uh, inside Google? And how do you think the company is doing living up to that? Uh, I mean, we still have it in, you know, when we write our uh, values, you know, we have uh, internally, we have uh, three respect values and, uh, you know, and, and as part of the framework, uh, you know, we still tell people don't be evil. And, you know, uh, I obviously in everything we do, you know, look, Google is uh, more open than most other companies. So we have an open culture. Uh, there's a lot of transparency and just like, uh, uh, you know, noisy democracy, there is uh, debate and discussion. And, you know, I'm proud that our uh, employees feel passionately about what we do. We've always given our employees more voice than any other company and, and we'll continue doing that. And, you know, we view them as important stakeholders. And increasingly as a society uh, for technology, there are going to be debates. You know, where do you apply technology? For example, as a company, we have chosen not to offer facial recognition services. And so we, you know, we set a high bar, uh, you know, when we don't get something right, uh, you know, we learn and we make progress. Uh, but I think as a framework, uh, you know, we are, uh, you know, uh, want to wake up every day and make sure everything we are doing is working to benefit society. And and uh, and, and that's, that's the journey our employees want to be part of. And, you know, I'm committed to doing that correctly. Okay. Um, let me turn to audience questions. Um, how do you see the future of work post pandemic? Uh, what are your concerns about ongoing remote work on teamwork, productivity, diversity, and inclusion? Oh, I'm so, you know, I'm so excited about figuring out the future of work. Uh, you know, 20 years ago, uh, Google, uh, you know, today many companies have implemented things similar to Google and in some ways we take it for granted, but we are committed to figuring out what is the best way we can make hybrid uh, work uh, possible. Uh, the reason it's important for us is it's not just for how we operate Google, but with Google Workspace and our, our tools and services, we can help other companies uh, operate in different models as well. Uh, and technology will play a big role. Uh, you know, I think figuring out how not to always make physical presence be the most important way by which you can be productive, mm -hmm. uh, I think is, is a big thing for technology to solve. We are experimenting with our spaces over time. You know, we are reconfiguring our office spaces to run experiments where it's easy for people to come together and, you know, have group meetings and so on. And, and there are times they can be productive working from home. And, and so we are going to run pilots and figure this out. But it's one of the things I'm uh, very excited by because I think it's going to drive a tremendous improvement in productivity over time globally. It'll also pull more people into the workforce who aren't able to be part of it today. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, to, to your first question about am I a technology optimist? Yes, I, I think future of work is going to be an area where we are going to see more innovation than ever before. Um, I have time for a very short question and a very short answer to maybe too big a question, but it just goes to the, the issue of uh, uh, biases and algorithms and AI and what you're doing to work to keep racial and other biases out of it. And I'm afraid you got to do that in about 90 seconds. Um, you know, we, you know, as a company, we have clearly committed to AI principles and, you know, we, we have deep processes to evaluate. We publish a lot of research. Uh, in fact, I mentioned earlier why we chose not to offer facial recognition APIs as a company. Uh, we've clearly stated, uh, you know, uh, AI bias being a deep area of concern in our AI principles. Uh, we publish a lot of research. Uh, having said that, the, uh, these are difficult areas. I think as an AI community, uh, you know, we are a bit behind globally in terms of, you know, elevating uh, the awareness and consciousness around all this. And so we all have more work to do there. Great. Um, I think we'll end here. I really appreciate uh, you joining us uh, is very illuminating. You've got a lot of big uh, issues and decisions to make. And so we'll all be 
watching closely, but uh, Sundar, Sundar Pichai, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, thanks, Steve, and uh, congrats on your long journey and your retirement, and I uh, hope the next few years are fruitful for you as well. I appreciate that very much. Okay. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you.